I experience a tension at the center of this text from Romans. It's right there in verses 3 through 5. Suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint. Perhaps the tension isn't so much at the center of the text as it is at the center of my being. Attention where the words meet my lived experience. I understand most of Paul's logic here. I can see how endurance produces character and character produces hope, but I stumble over that first part. Suffering produces. I tense up, I stumble at this idea that suffering produces. Now I can see places where this is true. I can see how the suffering of the saints of emancipation or the suffering of the saints of the civil rights movement produced endurance and hope that led justice forward. And I can see how the suffering of the saints of the Stonewall Rebellion led to this movement for queer rights that I already mentioned earlier, but are being stripped away at such an alarming pace across the country. And I can see how the suffering of Jesus was inevitable, given his ministry, but led to this hope for humanity. I can see all of that, yet there are times when the suffering that I have experienced the suffering that I have witnessed has been just that, just suffering. Unproductive, unexplainable, unimaginable. One of the first things I learned in my chaplaincy training was what not to say. If you've ever sat with someone in the depths of their suffering, you know how much you want to make it better. How you would do or say anything to just somehow make it okay. And out of that drive, you blurt things like, everything happens for a reason. Or it's all part of God's plan. But how do you say that to someone who has just lost their child? As if there were any reason at all for that to have happened. Or how do you say that to someone who's just received a terminal cancer diagnosis? How do you say these things in the face of dementia or deep poverty or the death of a loved one by suicide? There are times when the suffering I have experienced and the suffering I have witnessed is just suffering. And so it's hard for me to square that with Paul's eloquent, beautiful verse that suffering produces something of value. It's hard for me to square it because I don't think that I could say, I know that I wouldn't say in any number of circumstances to someone who was suffering, hey, good news, this is going to be productive for you. Yet, at the same time, there's this other truth. The truth also of my lived experience. The truth that 
Some of those same moments, some of the hardest moments of my life have made me who I am today. The truth that suffering has in my own experience, often clarified my values, deepened my relationships, and has, in hindsight, produced my character. So I come to this text from Romans trying to put these two pieces together. Even though they feel like magnets when you try to push the same pole towards each other and you, you get close and you get close, but they're never quite touching, I'm trying to get these two pieces to hold together, even though they seem like they contradict. And part of me wants to argue with Paul, wants to say, hey, Paul, according to contemporary spiritual care training, you don't say that. You don't say this to someone who's suffering. But this is written by someone who understood suffering. Paul understood suffering. We have scriptures of Paul bringing suffering. He understood it from the perspective of a persecutor. That's who he was before his conversion. And we have scriptures of Paul on the receiving end of suffering, being imprisoned for the sake of the gospel, receiving rejection and hatred for spreading the good news of Jesus Christ. And furthermore, this is someone, from what we know historically, who knew physical suffering. Many historians believe that Paul had some sort of chronic illness or experienced chronic pain. So I'm forced to take Paul at his word here. This isn't written from some high and mighty position of someone who's never yet experienced hardship. This is written by a guy who gets it who knows what suffering is like, intimately, daily even. So what is this endurance that Paul is talking about? If suffering produces endurance, what is that? The Greek word here is hippomone, and it can be translated endurance, or perseverance, or patience. Perhaps that's part of why I experience a tension at the center of this text. I'm not a very patient person. I wish I was, but I'm not. <laughs> and we don't live in a very patient world, do we? We can communicate sometimes in unremarkably fast ways. We can get where we need to go pretty quickly unless you're ghosted by a city bus. That can happen too. We can have access to pretty much any book, movie, TV show with just a press of a few buttons. I found out this week that my phone can control my TV. I didn't even know that was possible. And m many of us who are lucky enough, we can go to the store and we can buy just about any food that we want to, regardless of if that food is actually in season or not. There's not much in our contemporary life that cultivates patience. And then there's my own temperament. I'm not a very patient person. I never have been. I sort of have this operating mode of striving for things. <laughs> I like to do stuff. I like to make things, create things. I'm at my happiest when I can see something taking shape before me. So why I became a minister, this is how I know this call is from God somewhere outside of me, because this job requires so much patience. It's a constant practice for me. Now this patience, this endurance, hippomone, it's not just a passive thing. It is active. You don't just sit around. There's, there's some movement, no matter how small. And again, I think I can see that most clearly when I think of the patience that's born out of these larger struggles and movements. I find it a little harder when it's personal. When I'm trying to see how hippomone, how endurance, 
and perseverance and patience occurs in the depths of grief or illness or depression. But if I sit and I try to see things through divine logic, not human logic, if I sit and I try to see things through divine logic, not my own flawed, impatient, imperfect human logic, I think that I can see some glimmers of it. I think of the patience of caretakers, specifically the caretakers who cared for my grandmother and Noah's grandfather when their health was declining and when their dementia was progressing. I think of the perseverance of members of our own congregation who are on that same journey. I think of the perseverance of so many of us in the wake of someone we love dying. The endurance it takes to just get up in the morning and live our life with this hole where that person used to be. And I can start to see in those small moments and those tiny choices a glimmer of how these things might connect, how the truth that not all suffering is productive or happens for a reason, and the truth that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope. I can see where they might, through a divine logic, come to touch. It's hard for us sometimes to see divine logic. Paul writes about it in the second half of this scripture. Paul grapples with how God could die for us. How God could think it was worth it to preach love so fiercely and so tenaciously and so radically that it would lead to the cross. It doesn't make sense. Paul says it doesn't make sense, not in human logic, but in divine logic. It does. Because divine logic says, you're not perfect but I will love you until the day that I die. Divine logic says, you don't have to earn it. You don't have to do anything for me to love you. I just do. It's the kind of logic that if we can't see it in our current moment, we can read about it in other places. We can read stories like the one from Exodus this morning. God has loved his people so much, has loved them out of slavery, has loved them through parted waters, and here they are in the wilderness, and they are still complaining. Such imperfect people. And God says, I still love you. So here is water from this rock so that you will be sustained. We can read these stories as reminders of what God has done in the past and as something to remind us or help us understand what God might be doing now, even if we can't tell. These might help us make the magnets touch for a moment so that we can say, God, I don't know where you are, but I am going to cling to this hope that you have done it before. And you're doing it now. The theologian Howard Thurman wrote quite a bit about suffering. He actually talked about suffering as a sacrament, partly based on this text. And there's a poem of his that I kept returning to this week. Maybe you've heard it before. It's called Our Little Lives. And he writes, Our Little Lives are big problems. These we place upon thy altar. 
The quietness in thy temple of silence again and again rebuffs us. For some there is no discipline to hold them steady in the waiting, and the minds reject the noiseless invasion of the spirit. The nights crowded with frenzied dreams and restless churnings, we do not know how to do what we know to do. We do not know how to be who we know to be. Our little lives are big problems. These we place upon thy altar. Brood over our spirits, our Father. Blow upon whatever dream thou hast for us, that there may glow once again upon our hearths the light from thy altar. Pour out upon us whatever our spirits need of shock, of lift, of release, that we might find strength for these days, courage and hope for tomorrow. In confidence we rest in thy sustaining grace, which makes possible triumph in defeat, gain in loss, love in hate. Verse 5 says that hope does not disappoint us. Not because of human logic, but because of divine logic. Because God's love, the love that doesn't require anything of us, the love that doesn't need us to be perfect, that love is poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit which has been given to us. God does not say that following this path will get us out of suffering. If anything, scripture and experience show us quite the opposite. That to be human, to love, to have, and to hold means that there will be suffering. What God does promise is to be with us amidst our troubles. God promises this living water that will pour and pour and pour and pour and pour in a ceaseless flow into our hearts, even as our tears and sobs and sweat and even our own blood pour out from us. This cycle of pouring in and pouring out, pouring in and and pouring out, pouring in and pouring out. Amen.